Now just a quick couple of housekeeping items. Your audio is muted, but your chat feature is enabled and we want you to participate. So please feel free to use that chat feature to introduce yourselves, to reach out to one another. And at the end of the discussion, we're, we are gonna open it up to audience Q&A. So please type your questions into the chat box. Um, I also want to just say a quick thank you to Change staff, Spencer Cronin and Allie Evans for making today possible. And a very warm thank you to our featured speakers. First, thank you to Kerwin Webb. Let me introduce you to um, the well-known community leader and organizer who is Kerwin. Uh, Kerwin is the founder of his own training, coaching, and consulting business. He's also a graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary. He has also founded a nonprofit focused on child development, youth outreach, and adult empowerment. Kerwin currently serves as the Associate Pastor of Youth and Young Adults at the Second Baptist Church of Asbury Park. He is the President of the Greater Red Bank Chapter of the NAACP. He is the Coalition Liaison for the New Jersey Social Justice Remembrance Coalition. And if that wasn't enough, he is also the Board Chair of our, um, a very close collaborator of ours, the T. Thomas Fortune Foundation. And I also want to extend a warm thank you and welcome and brief introduction to the director of this film, The Long Shadow, Francis Causey. Uh, Francis Causey is an Emmy Award winning documentary filmmaker and journalist. So if that name sounded familiar to you, there's a reason. She has 15 years of experience as a senior producer at CNN and previous work uh, has been hailed as a uh, New York Times critics pick. Her films have been seen on Netflix, PBS, the History Channel and her TED talk, which I highly recommend. Uh, continues to reach audiences around the world. So I'm very excited for this conversation. I'm looking forward to unpacking uh, this film with you both. And at this point, I'm going to hand the reins over to Kerwin and ask that you uh, take it away, but also please introduce a little bit about the, uh, the coalition. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, like Sarah said, my name is Kerwin Webb, and those titles means things, but um, I am most of all someone who wants to facilitate change and help people to come together in a world of chaos and confusion. Um, part of the reason that I'm here is representing the New Jersey Social Justice Remembrance Coalition, NJSJRC, a lot of words, but our coalition was formed um, to honor the legacy of Samuel Johnson. Samuel Johnson, um, is goes in goes down in history as New Jersey's only documented lynching, and it happened in Eatontown, New Jersey, in 18, um, 1886. Our coalition, uh, in partnership with the Equal Justice Initiative out of Montgomery, Alabama, um, have formed to commit or complete what they call their Community Remembrance Project. That includes a high school essay contest, uh, soil collection ceremony and the marker installation and dedication um, ceremony. Those things are ongoing and um, we would invite you to um, join us for any of them or all of them. You can find more information on njremembrance.org. Um, but I am more excited tonight to be here with Francis and to um, have a discussion around this really important and what I consider a groundbreaking film, a uh, documentary film um, that is poignant and timely for the for where we are in our nation's history tonight. Um, and so we're going to look at the trailer to, to help people to level set, get an idea of um, what the documentary is about if people haven't seen it. And then Francis and I are gonna dive right into a conversation and discussion about what we saw in the film, what came out of it. But we invite you to put your questions in the chat because it's gonna be interactive um, so that we all can learn and grow from this. And so now uh, take a few moments and we'll look at um, the trailer of The Long Shadow. I was born in Greensboro, North Carolina into a world where white superiority was rarely questioned. I knew both sides of my family owned slaves. I never understood how much my own uncomfortable journey was connected to an untold history. You can't understand the United States history without understanding the role that slavery played. It actually defined the nation. Almost every founding father was a slave owner. It was just completely integrated into the thinking of the wealthy men that wrote the Constitution. 
the Southern colonies were not willing to be part of a union unless the institution of slavery was protected. And the price of protecting that institution was disproportionate power to the South. And it carries through today. They're mad. I'm mad. We should all be mad because of what's going on right now. We're still suffering the after effects of those two powerful regimes that comprise the bulk of U.S. history, slavery and Jim Crow. This culture is still punishing and penalizing Africans with no attempt to connect the dots between slavery, Jim Crow, and the present. It's criminal. We had it exactly backwards in terms of the Negro problem. We have a white problem in the United States, and it's reflected in our politics, the way we do our economy, and the way we think about ourselves. Wow. Um, powerful, powerful, powerful. Um, just, Francis, just open up and just uh, share some thoughts about the process that you went through. Before I ask any questions, just kind of walk us through some of your thinking as it progressed. Thank you, Minister Webb. And I'm gonna call you Curran uh, from here on out. Um, thank you very much. I'm honored, honored uh, to be on this panel with you. And thank you, Sarah and Spencer and David and Allie and all the organizers um, at Change um, for doing this um, uh, Zoom, this discussion. Um, you know, it, it really has been a, um, a lifelong journey for me. Uh, and I was catalyzed, Kerwin, by the coverage that I saw on my former uh, network that I worked for. I worked for CNN for 14 years and I was watching Ferguson unfold. And I had made the jump to documentary film from television news because I, you know, that there were there were so many um, the story really intractable, terrible stories are not told very well in that format. And so when I read about Ferguson, um, it it just catalyzed for me um, that I wanted to connect in one sitting um, for as many people as possible. Um, how we needed to reframe our nation's history. And so I had to go all the way back, right? And I had to show, I had to illustrate through, through fact-based uh, storytelling, um, the principles, we, get, we hear a lot about Lexington and Concord and the Tea Party and things like that, but there is a equally or more powerful story that's never been told. And so I sought out um, the, the creme de la creme of historic um, uh, historians like um, Dr. Horn, who is just an incredible scholar. And it just opened up for me um, this terrible, terrible, tragic story of what we did to Africans in our country, starting back in the 1600s, all the way up to the present. And it was really challenging to connect those dots. But unfortunately, you know, our country has really been programmed, uh, hardwired to a very different history. And it's so critical um, that, that this history is known. And so um, that's what I tried to do. That was my process because I had experienced, um, I could see as a child, I didn't have the words for it, but I could see what was happening in my own family. And later as I, you know, as I grew up and went out into the world, I'm like, I, I don't understand why um, more white people don't see this. They don't understand it. And I came to understand that, you know, just never was taught. I knew that I had been taught just the bare minimum uh, and, and other, other things that were just patently false. And so I really made it my life's work um, to uncover this history. Wow, that's amazing. Okay. Um, one of the one of the statements you made in the uh, in the trailer is there was a time when white supremacy was rarely questioned. Has that changed? Unfortunately, um, not in the way that I would like it to. Or I'm sure many people on this Zoom, right? And so, what I wanted to do is understand that this whole creation, this 
this thing called whiteness, right? I, I hope if you haven't seen the film, you, you get a chance to see it, those on the Zoom. Uh, it was, this was, um, this was a manufactured um, concoction, right? To, to justify um, the racism, the institutional racism. And, and what I came to understand was apartheid, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we had, and we still have the vestiges of apartheid uh, in our country. And it's, that's really hard, I think, for Americans. Uh, I don't think it's hard for African Americans to understand, but white Americans. And so I, while I made the film for everybody, I really made this for folks who maybe weren't as conscious or aren't as conscious of, of their privilege. And so unfortunately, um, when we see vestiges that are active in our society, um, there's just no question that there are people who believe that white is superior to black. That's never been proven in any way, shape, size, or form. And so um, we, need, we need to really go back and understand the roots, the genesis of, uh, of our DNA, why we are this way. We need to make uh, the implications, slavery and Jim Crow, we need to make this a national priority. And I think unfortunately, you know, Mr. Floyd, um, uh, his passing and, and others, and today as we're speaking, perhaps it's happening, um, you know, African-Americans are being um, uh, killed uh, and the carnage continues. And we need to have a Kerner-like commission there was a commission about this in the 60s and they came up with all kinds of recommendations. And there's always this, they were never implemented because there's always this white pushback against black advancement in our, in our country. And so there's no, there's no more time for hand wringing, you know, and oh, I, it's such a big problem. I don't know what to do. It's time, and which is why I love, one of the reasons I love doing this with change. I love that their, their name is a, is a name, it's a, a, but it's also a verb, right? Because yeah, yeah. we, we're at the point where there's, we need to make tangible change in our society. And I think it's slowly, slowly beginning, but we can't lose patience. Yeah, so that, I, I love some of the things that you said. And I think, let's unpack that, the, the way that the whiteness became a thing. Um, because we were talking a little bit before we started, there's an economic interest in maintaining um, separation, segregation, and division. Um, interestingly, um, you said something, we need to reframe the narrative, right? And so as a, as a, a reporter, journalist, a person who worked at a new news network, the news networks have a big hand in what we see and come to understand. How much responsibility would you lay at their feet for the seemingly intractability of racism and white supremacy? Right, and, and great question. And there's, a, there's like 20 answers in that one thing, uh, one question. Um, and it, beautiful, beautiful, um, you know, beautiful question. So I encourage everyone to watch my film, Heist, Who Stole the American Dream, which is on, uh, YouTube. Um, uh, it's complicated, right, with the networks. And so I talk about in that film how we went from 60 big media entities to five. And their bottom line is profit, right? I mean, so it used to be before, um, you know, there was CNN, before there was MSNBC, um, the networks made most of their money, the big three made most of their money off of of uh, uh, entertainment and the news division was the price they paid for those extreme profits. And so in Heist, I talk about what's happened to the media, right? And unfortunately, you know, it's not a, it's not, the news media is not the public service that it used to be, that it regulated mm. was to be, right? And we got away, we got away from, we did away with the fairness doctrine. And unfortunately that gave rise when we did that. I mean, when they deregulated in 1996, I talk about it, it was under President Clinton. They, they deregulated the media. And so what you did is you went from 60 to six, and then you had the rise of talk 
radio, which was over 90% conservative, right? And so it really, heist is a precursor to the long shadow, right? It's, it's, it's really a tale of this um, uh, political tale of, and Ian Haney Lopez talks about it beautifully in the film, dog whistle politics. And so I think in, in a huge part of our identity politics, is that as the message has gotten more diverse, um, which is ironic to there being six media companies, but you you know you see the rise of the streamers, and what happens is um, you you get even though you have more ways to receive messages, it's it's very diluted, right? And so you know, we used to I'm I'm old enough to say that I don't I don't remember tuning in completely to Walter Cronkite, but certainly Dan Rather and Peter Jennings, you know, we, we look to them to set the, the nation's agenda each night and we, they were yeah. trusted sources. And so um, you see a little bit scattershot, you know, but it's a, it's a really, um, there's not a more important or more difficult um, and complicated subject because we have swept this under the rug for so long, but anti-black racism, institutionalized anti-black racism has been has not been dealt with for so long that that people can't even imagine that it exists. And yeah. um, and that's the problems that I think probably you're having with your neighbors, you know, people who are just unconscious in their racism uh, and don't know how to talk to folks. And we could talk about some of some ways you might speak to them about about their beliefs. Awesome. Cool. Good. Good. Um, and and so I'm glad that you you answered that way. That every it's so complicated because everything is intertwined with other things. Um, and so just let, let me frame for those. Hopefully you watched the film before, but if you didn't, I'll kind of frame some of it. We we viewed um, you re reminiscing and saying how you didn't see uh, what was going on, how things weren't. Um, as evident to you. And then as you came about, you said, hey, something is wrong. In the film, you have the Lockheed Martin incident yeah. where something was wrong and people were making complaints about it. But again, we see capitalism and profits. What, if anything, what can be done? Because we know that money's talks and in our society that has been unequal, the side that has the money is the side that does the bad. Right. So, so what Lockheed was about, first of all, first and foremost, was about this incredible hero in Mr. Willis, who, who was, a, was a, uh, an African-American gentleman making, assembling aircraft, aircraft wings in Meridian, Mississippi, uh, and uh, the largest employer in the area, union, he was making good wages. Nobody had more to lose than Mr. Willis than, than when, he, when he spoke out. And they kept warning the white upper management that this guy, Doug Williams, was, was super dangerous. And so um, the, the, what we can do is we can remember um, people like Mr. Willis, we can connect the dots, uh, but the fact that his, Mr. Willis's upper management, the white management, they were afraid of Doug Williams. They were mm. afraid of him for weeks. They, they, he took a week off after he got really mad and they, he came back and they did not, they did not punish him in any way. So what it's really about is ultimately it's about income equality, right? And so it, it's about um, a, a rising tide should lift all boats. And I hope if people take away nothing but the from the film, except that what the film is saying is that when given an opportunity, and I show the Black Pioneers of Canada, I show the Namanai Hall, uh, the enslaved who were freed by Robert Carter. It was about self-determination. Right. That's what this country is about. If you go all the way back to 1609 or 1607, it's really about um, freedom from the yoke of England. It was a whole let's give credit where credit's due. This 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 system envisioned by my uncle and others was was 
protean. I mean, it was, it was, it was really, really neat, except it had this huge strike against it in that it was not available to all people. And so here we have the largest economy the world has even come close to creating. And we have fully 30% of African Americans who are, now let's give credit to ones who are participating. I'm not, I'm not trying to take away from those successes, right? But by and large, we have disproportionate number of African Americans that, that have, um, you know, have problems accessing our economy, right? So what this is really about, and this is the part where there's no more hand wringing, there's no more white fragility. It's really about taking money from resource rich school systems, people, uh, you know, and, and putting it into the African American community. Uh, when it, PPP, right? So the government just distributed trillions of dollars, right? And uh, the pay tech, pre, Paycheck Protection Program, they, after, once Biden came into office, they understood, they studied it, that, that um, we've lost 53% of black owned small businesses in this country due to COVID. They were not accessing PPP, why? Because PPP was distributed by mainstream banks. And if you know anything about banking, African-Americans do not have a great relationship with mainstream banks for good reason. As I talk about in my film Heist, they were targeted, right? So let's be really clear, we need to, we need to reparations, refurbishment, I don't know what you wanna call it, but we need to get more money in the hands of the African-American community, whether it's through business grants, whether it's through reparations like Evanston, Illinois is doing, whether it's through anybody, we give grants, any, any royalties we make from our, from our film, we turn around in the form of reparation grants to needy individuals, right? Well, you know, worthy individuals. Uh, and so um, there's tons of, of, of ways to do that. And we sent out an email not too long ago about the, you know, the, the groups that are, will connect you with folks. We are, I consider myself a white ally, Curran, to a black led movement, right? Awesome. We, it's time that we start, uh, you know, we, we enslave um, Africans and, Af you know, and later African-Americans were denied access to the American dream. That's really what it comes down to. Okay. Um, I, I agree with you. Um, income, in, income equality or access, right? Creating equal access to the, the, the mechanisms to making income. But then that goes to those um, white lashes that, that, talk, that we talked about after emancipation and reconstruction. You had, you know, um, Civil Rights Act, uh, even the election of Barack Obama, and I would even say recently the election of um, Biden, we see the, the backlash. And I think what we're missing, I agree totally with that part, put, getting money to African-Americans, but what about the accountability that seems to be missing right. for, for those who do not play by the rules? Is there anything that we can do in that regard um, as well? Well, yeah, well, yes. I mean, I think we can do it in our own lives. I mean, if you see injustice and you can speak out against it, that it's safe to speak out against it. Um, you can go to your planning and zoning commission meetings. You can go to your county commit, you know, your board of uh, supervisors, you, you know, your city council. You can have your voice be heard. It's very, very, this is such a, um, it's so woven into our fabric that, that I think we need to make it na a national priority. So I hope everyone here will, will support HR 40, um, uh, that, uh, uh, wants to look at is simply just saying, let's study the impact of slavery and Jim Crow. Let's make some recommendations. Forget about implementing it, although we need to implement it, but it's really hard when, you know, uh, the opposition leader in the Senate says, well, his family didn't own slaves. And so I don't know why, you know, uh, I don't know why we should be worried about that kind of thing. And I think, I think a lot of people hear that and they just accept it 
at, you know, as true, right? And yeah. so what I wanted, I, what I would ask Senator McConnell if I ever met him, I would say, um, well, okay, did your family get social security? Did your family have a home in the 60s mm. in a prosperous neighborhood that was passed on? Did you, did your, you know, did you ever get a, a maybe a beat up old car that was, that was, um, you know, that, that you inherited? Um, you know, so every, as, as Dr. Allen says so beautifully in the film, and she's writing a book about the Lemon Project, which I'm so excited to read. Um, she's so eloquent when she talks about the lack of generational wealth transfer. Now, I'm not saying that a majority, again, I have to check in with my privilege, right? I'm not saying that most people expect to inherit a lot of money, you know, right. but, but there's no... You know, even if it's just a beat up car or if it's five hundred dollars, it's like there's there. Those are important things um, towards um, towards, you know, being able right. to access what we talk about. So um, in, in terms of holding people accountable every single day at the local, state and federal level, we, we have to speak out. And I think if people are on this call, they care deeply about it. And if you if you. If you need any suggestions, you just tell me where you live and I, I will come up with uh, your <laughs> county supervisors or your city council and I'll understand what's happening policy wise in your, you know, I'll research and tell you, okay, this is happening in your community. So listen and, and take those sometimes difficult steps. So Francis, um, and we'll get, we're going to open it up to Q and A um, from the audience in a minute if there are those because I don't want to hog the um, entire thing. But in the film, you ask the question, why does this keep happening over and over again? Is it, could it be that the majority of people in this country that um, claim themselves to be white either are asleep to it, ignorant about it, or in favor of it? Is, is that what our history says? Yes, I think, I think it's all those things. Right, and I think, um, Kerwin, that um, you know, um, it it has been, and we we must must remember that it was intentional to sweep it under the rug. I mean, this is what we've done throughout our entire history, right? And so, um, if you don't have an honest, forthright accounting or reckoning, right? So we've never had the reckoning. That we really need to have, and and I think we started on that path um, with with you know with Black Lives Matter, um, and it was an and and as a result, billions of dollars have been transferred into the African American community to activists um, to try and make that you know to keep that going, um, and I I get I get frustrated with folks who are like, oh, change isn't happening fast enough. I get that. If I'm an African-American, I get that, right? I totally get that. Um, it's going to take, it's, I do think it's going to take a long time uh, to undo. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's a terrible thing to say, but it's like we, until we can get the wealth back into um, the African-American community, we can get folks going to college and we can make income inequality, you know, less prominent. I mean, that's a key, it's a key, key, key part of this whole thing. There was income inequality, um, certainly before Black Lives Matter um, and, you know, a hundred years ago. And so we need to understand and people like companies that have benefited, they need to, to have mentoring programs. They need to do all the things that we know help get people to the next level. Let me ask you this, and this might be a little off topic, so you can push back on it and not answer it. But so you had you had in your um, in the clip as you were transitioning. Um, this is when um, you had a uh, Reagan, and he was talking about they're going to get rid of the scourge, which is the war on drugs, and those types of things. So for me, and I'm I'm uh, I wasn't around when Reagan was president. I was a few years after, but. <laughs> His trickle down economics seems to be the thing that exacerbated the income inequality. Yes. How is it that politicians who are lifers haven't realized that that, like if you go back to that point, maybe it'll even out. 
I'm glad you asked because that's the whole point of, of um, the film Heist, right? So this, this actually was a, a plan. I mean, politicians have used the race card and scapegoated um, you know, communities of color throughout our entire history, right? That's, that's, that's like low hanging fruit for, you know, um, Lee Atwater did it, you know, for rape for, I think it was Nixon, David, correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, you know, so that's been happening, unfortunately, throughout our entire history, right? But, um, you know, rape, I mean, this was a plan that was pretty much implemented. And they would tell you that, you know, that, that again, I, I don't mean to just say it was so simple as that, because I go into, in, into all of that, but it was implemented. And it was this idea of this free market ideology and, you know, the sanctity of the free market. And as David K. Johnston says in the film, you know, everything has rules, including markets. And it's a question of who those rules benefit, right? And mm. so um, while we can regulate our way out of this some, I mean, we need to make, I think all Americans agree that, at least I think a majority of Americans agree that we want a fair system. And that's what drove me to make this movie. It's like, this is so colossally, this system is so rigged and so unfair for African-Americans, right? And so um, educate yourself, understand why we are where we are. Um, and if you just watch those two films, I think it'll, if you probably already know this, a lot of folks on this, on this Zoom, I'm sure um, know some of these things, but connect those dots and share it with your neighbors and um, you know, join um, groups like TEBA, uh, who came about together as Better Alliance, which is putting, I mean, ultimately, Kerwin, what it's about is Black and white need to break bread together. They need to live together. We need, we, it's just incredible in, in 2021 that we're still having this conversation, but we are, we need to accept it. And we need to get uh, more uh, income equality. Yeah. Spencer, um, Sarah, are there any questions you guys have from the chat that we can entertain? Um, one of the things, Francis, oh, is got that questions. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Great. go ahead. No, 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 Sarah. go ahead. Keep going. I'll pull them up. All right. So it was it, it was interesting, and this might have been before we came on air, um, that we are more segregated now yeah. than in the 1600s. We are more yes. divided now than then. It is mind blowing. But I think when it's statistics or things like that, people just put it out like it's impossible. Right. Um, and we need to bring it back to, look, no, every little, every person that you can contact, right? Like it can, we can, we can change it if we make ourselves change. Right, and, and so the, the, what you reference is a perfect example, right? So in the 60, early 1600s, you have indentured slavery, unfortunately, as we came to know it wasn't, um, I mean, it, it probably was around in some kind of forms, but it wasn't what was institutionalized was this idea of servitude, indentured servitude. And so you had black and white coming to the shores, both indentured. And why I think it's instructive and why I thought it was so important to put in the movie is that they they were allies. Poor mm -hmm. was allies. And, you know, black or white didn't matter. They were allied in Bacon's Rebellion, which was such an important event in our history. Yep. And yep. guys like my uncle, my family, you know, they and others said, oh, we're in trouble. If, if um, you know, if the poor revolt against us, then we're in bad shape because we need them, you know, et cetera, for labor. And so um, it one law at a time, I talk about it in the movie, you gradually started to see white indentured win their freedom and the, and the laws rigged locally in Virginia and in the South and up, the, up North as well. I hope that's one thing you take away from the movie that this, the South's political influence uh, you know, infected the rest of the country. Um, and we exported um, you know, uh, our, our insanity to the rest of the country. But uh, that, that white, white indenture were being freed, they would win their freedom and they would rig the laws locally to, re, to, to enslave. I mean, that's how slavery began, institutional slavery. It was a, it was a, 
a, a black indentured man who became a slave, right? And, and, and tragically, my own family, um, uh, the gentleman I talk about in the film was a third generation Pendleton. And he, he Thomas Jefferson came to him and said, okay, make sure slavery becomes American law. Right there, were, there's great scholarship from Dr. Horn, which I hope um, many of you will will research. But uh, it, it was clear where capitalism was headed, and and people that participated in Bacon's Rebellion wanted more for their labor. Right? What what is in effect today? You want to get maximum mm -hmm. amount for your labor, right? Yep. And so uh, this was a system that was engineered. And have, because people, have, white people have benefited from so much, no one has ever spoken out. Not no one, but Not this white person has. Not but yeah. Awesome. Um, Sarah, go ahead with the questions. So first thing I want to encourage, first of all, this conversation is so dynamic. It's really a joy just to be present and to take, take this all in. Um, we do have some excellent questions. I'm going to go with a, 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 an easy one, a softball, and then I'll keep going. Um, the first one is just, this is a wonderful film. Do you plan to get this documentary into schools? It seems it would be appropriate for middle and high school level. And I agree. Yes. Thank you. Great question. And we have tried. Um, I don't know if some of you parents out there, um, you know, if you're in the PTA, um, it's very difficult to get this type of film into junior high and high school. We have tried um, and we just, we ran into a roadblock. And I think if um, the, you know, cause it's quasi controversial. I mean, this was four years ago. You have to remember the film premiered four years ago, but since then, we would, we would give the film, I will send a DVD uh, to any school um, that wants it or a digital download. You can see the film on Canopy. Uh, it's also on Amazon Prime, although I think they're, they're charging for it now. So I don't want the schools to have to pay for it. So um, if you know, you know, if you're, if you have kids, you know, excuse me, but this BS that they're being taught, right? Some schools, it's, it's systems, it's better than others. But most, by and large, most of the nation's children's textbooks, history books come out of the Texas School Book Commission, which currently is casting slavery as a state's rights issue, right? And so this is just tragic. And so parents have got to understand what their kids are being taught go to your PTA, go to your, your, your school um, superintendent saying, this is just flat wrong. Um, but it's a very, very tough, we've even had a hard time getting it at the college level, Sarah, I'm afraid to say. Wow. Um, so it's, 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 it's challenging. Um, and if, if people came to us and said they wanted the film, we would give it to them. Oh, you're muted, Sarah. Yep, I did mute it because I had a toddler in the background. So apologies for any delightful songs that you heard in the background. Um, no, it's, it is facilitating difficult conversations like this needs to happen. And so I really like this next question, which is as you grew up and began questioning the racism and divisions that you were raised with, what were some of the uncomfortable conversations that you had with your family members? And how would you advise others to approach these types of conversations in their own families? Great question. Probably the most important one. Um, and I would add, you know, friends and fam you know, friends and neighbors. Um, so it was my family, like a lot, probably of families, they were kind of split. Some didn't really, they didn't really quite understand it. And um, others really didn't like it. Uh, and it cost it, it cost me those relationships. Okay. Um, there were other people like my dad, you know, who had grown up on all this lore around the Civil War. I mean, in the South, and Kerwin can attest to this, genealogy is just everything. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, he was very proud of all of our, our family members, you know, who had participated in the Civil War. And, you know, and I, and I had to have a conversation with him. He, he saw the film and came to, oh, we, we showed the film at, at uh, the Oxford, Mississippi Film Festival, Kerwin, by the way. By and large, it's been very difficult to get the film that we know of, you know, doing official screenings 
um, and events. It's been very, very difficult to get the film shown in the South. So, you know, um, I'm a journalist. Everybody else in my family, they're business people. Um, you know, they never knew what I did at CNN. They didn't, it didn't quite connect the dots. Um, but yeah, it definitely was difficult and cost me um, relationships. But, you know, this is my life's work. Uh, and um, I, you have to be passionate about documentary film. It really has to come from your soul because they're so hard to make. They're so expensive and, and so difficult um, to get out there into the world. And so um, it, it was... Um, it was interesting. It was kind of a hodgepodge. And so my recommendation for people, I don't, Nick can share with you our 15 minute version. I mean, we've done everything possible. There's a study guide, there's a toolkit, you know, we've done every, I mean, everything possible for people to see the information in this film. And, you know, it's those people, you know, that need to see it the most probably aren't going to reach out. And, and try and find this information on their own. And so a family member or a friend might be just that person, even if they're, they're people that are consciously racist, but even the people who are unconscious, right? We need to get as many people on board behind HR 40 and examining this issue as possible. And there's just a lot of people that don't understand what's happened. And those people, those are the people we can reach with this film. Sarah, let me, let me take it. Oh, go for it, go ahead. Yeah, so in, in having co difficult conversations with people in your families about difficult topics, sometimes what I find is helpful is to ask questions and to sort of expect that you might get um, uh, treated in a way that you're not happy with, but try to stay on the, okay, I'm just trying to understand. Don't yell at me, but just so that they can really talk out some of these things. And sometimes when you hear yourself saying stuff, you'll be like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. And then I've come to it now. So now I have to deal with it in that way. That's a great, great way to approach it. I also want to stress for our Brookdale students, if you ever want to come in and just have a conversation with us about how to tackle difficult topics in history and also how to have those difficult conversations, um, we're, we're here as a resource and a safe space for you. Um, Okay, so then this next question is actually about your work. As you said, it's hard to make documentary films. Yeah. And here I think we have someone who's got some film background because they wanna know, um, how did you decide how to visualize the story of this documentary? In particular, those events that take place in the distant past, it's so hard to foster that connection where people actually feel tied to something that happened hundreds of years ago, actually not even that long ago. And I mean, it's hard for them to envision things that happened two decades ago. So how did you find the right paintings, the right photographs, the old film, the, um, I believe there's a clip of audiovisual testimony, or at least it's um, the audio testimony that's there. Uh, how did you go through your selection process? Great question. Um, and it's a, you know, um, history is a living organic thing, as David can attest, right? It is, there's, there's scholarship like Dr. Horns that, 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 I mean, he's just a seminal, such an important American scholar. He just won an American book award for his latest piece on, on uh, the 16th century in our country and across the world. And he's an amazing scholar. So the whole point of the movie, right, was that the same things that are happening to some degree, the same thinking, the same feelings, the same things that are happening in, in 1600s are happening today, right? History, uh, you know, what Namanai Hall and what um, uh, the, the Black Pioneers, that was all about self-determination, right? Winning self-determination for themselves against all of these odds, right? And so our history has an impact on the present, in, particularly in terms of, which is why I, I did, I looked at education, employment, and housing, right? The, the three-legged stool of the American dream, right? And so those things, just think about your own family, knowing your own history. This is a great thing about Namanai Hall. You know, those folks um, were, were manumitted and I spoke, I mean, it was thrilling for me to speak to the ant, to the descendants of, of, of the enslaved who had been freed and what that meant for their family, right? And they, they knew their history. They, 
as as Latanya says so beautifully, we're about to do a we're about to do on October twentieth. I hope you'll join us a fourth anniversary of the release of the film, and Dr. Horn is going to be on um, that Zoom with us, as well as Latanya, who founded the Namini Hall Slave Legacy Project. And so history really gets a, a bad rap. Uh, and, and I wanted to, you know, Mr. Willis's story was kind of the contemporary example of the failure to deal with these issues in our society. And I've had some people say, oh, well, why didn't you deal with, you know, Black Lives Matter and stuff? I mean, we're a very small production company. It's really hard for us to, you know, go back and add material, but I'm, I'm not sure I, I necessarily would because the same, the same things are present in our society that have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. In terms of the stories, you know, I just, I'm, my partner can attest, I mean, I'm just, I, I, I kind of work all the time, right? And so when I found those stories and they, you know, came from four different leads and, you know, I mean, I you just, you kind of intuitively know uh, as a journalist, you know, what's going to represent um, your, your thesis that you have for the film. Uh, and the images, you know, we made the film before it was really in vogue to like, I think if I had it to do over again, I'd go back, Sarah, and put a disclaimer that the images might be, um, you know, difficult for some people. And, you know, as a nonfiction filmmaker, um, I was, I, you know, I was telling a part of history, I, I hope some of which people had not heard. And so these images were historic proof um, of that time, but we, we tried to not um, have too many lynching um, images. These are, these are things, and, and Mr. Litwack, Professor Litwack is now um, passed on, but uh, he's so, I hope you'll, you'll check out some of his books. I mean, he's just an amazing scholar. Um, and, and understand that this happened in our country. This happened in our country. In fact, the gentleman who wrote the, the, the biography of Edmund Pendleton, that was a source uh, for much of, of the film, was what he won the Pulitzer Prize for history in 1952. He was also one of the, he led, was the ringleader for one of the most notorious lynchings in Virginia history. 1957 in Southern Georgia, we lynched, uh, white Americans lynched uh, a, a World War II hero, black World War II hero. That was not that long ago. You know, 1957. I'm thinking about all of the, um, the audiovisual testimony that I've worked with in throughout my research and work, but also that we have housed at change. We have integrated into our permanent exhibit audiovisual testimony from survivors of the Holocaust, survivors of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Um, we've woven in um, the stories and, and artifacts and archival items of um, Armenian genocide survivors. And I'm thinking so much around this idea of the human story and how important it is to give the human story and breathe life into the human story to make these people more than just a statistic. And one of the things that I found very powerful about your film is when you were weaving in those moments. And it's interesting, I'm just, um, I, this was occurring to me as one of the people um, wrote in the chat, as far as I can remember, this is the first time I heard the voices of former slaves. That is such a powerful moment to make that interpersonal connection, to localize it, to make the story yours. I mean, I, I really, I have to commend you for building that bridge. Well, thank you. I, and, but let me tell you the backstory to that too, Sarah, is, you know, when I was with my team and we were trying to, you know, we were starting on the film and I thought, how is that, how can I, as a white person, tell so much of the black experience in our country? I was, I was very sensitive I, to the, you know, the appropriation that I was somehow appropriating this story for profit. Let me just tell you right off the bat, these films don't even come close. These, these, these films don't even come close to making a profit. I mean, these films are, are my film was donated to, uh, and, and so they don't make a profit, but moreover, um, you know, how could I, as a white person, you know, tell this story? And I, 
you know, I just remember telling my team, I said, you know, I, I made this film for everybody, right? As a, a documentarian, it's like, I made it for everybody, but I really made it for, for white folks. And I tell you, the, the, the harshest criticism I've gotten is from some white liberals who say, you know, it just wasn't for me to tell the story. And, and so what I really tried hard to do was to make sure that I had as many black scholars talking about this history and I hope that come. I hope that comes across. I mean, we we really wanted. I, I think probably if I had it to over again, I hate. I've never appeared in any of my films before this one, and I never will again because it's just not in my natural wheelhouse. But we really wanted Alfrey Woodard um, to to narrate the film, and uh, we just couldn't afford her. She's twenty five thousand dollars an hour to narrate, mm. and so we were. You know, by the time you get to the end of the production post production schedule, you're really you know, there's just no money. So I, I would have loved uh, probably Ms. Woodard to have uh, told so much of the story. So um, at any rate, there you have it. The dirty underbelly of documentary filmmaking. <laughs> the nitty gritty. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, you need the resources in order to bring it to life. I mean, that's fair. It makes sense. Yeah. But let me ask you a question about this, the, the slave voices, right? So that was one of the things that I thought. So when I'm in the opening scene, that's actually in on my in my family's home place on my family's home place in Virginia, which is called Cuckoo, which is where a lot of the Pendleton enslaved are, are buried. And so I I was haunted whenever I would go there. I, I thought about it. Think about my great grandfather's buried there. All my families are buried. My family's buried there. My father's family. I did. I thought about the enslaved cemetery that was overgrown. And why, you know, why was it overgrown? And and the caretaker of that, it's still a private home. So I really didn't want to talk a lot about it. My cousin still owns it. Um, but it was very haunting to me to be there. But also, as I later learned, uh, my family's role in perpetuating all this. And so I knew I had to make this movie. We have a, an interesting question that I think maybe we could close on, but I also, Kerman, want to give you space if you had any follow-up questions. No, no, no. Let's you, go with the one mind? that you have. Okay. Um, here's, I, it's just a fascinating one. Um, for white people whose family came to this country in the early part of the 20th century, who insist this history isn't related to them, how do you recommend starting the discussion to help them see that they have benefited from white privilege? Well, um, let me say if your family received social security, if your family had housing in white neighborhoods, uh, the housing was more valuable. Um, chances are you, you maybe were denied, you worked hard, but you, you know, you, you might not have been denied just on because of the of the skin, color of your skin, right? And I always bring it down to, because I get, I mean, I get working class folks who come to me and say, well, you know, my family didn't own slaves. And a lot of people don't know that in the South, a lot of families own one or two or three slaves. But, um, you know, think about the African-American mother on a Friday night who sends her 18 year old son off uh, you know, to, to be with friends. Think about what she feels versus what a white mother might feel. There is just no question that if you have white skin in our society, you have an advantage. And if you don't understand that advantage, I, I really um, recommend that you look at the statistics. You look at um, for every $1 an African-American has in our society, uh, a white person has $10, right? So the, connecting the dots, it's there. And um, it's just, I hope that folks will, after this Zoom and maybe after watching the film, will, will understand it a lot more, get a perspective on your perspective and understand this history and understand how we have so, so uh, committed a, 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 a heinous act against Africans and later and their descendants, African-Americans in this country. And we need to make it right. We do. And we're starting, but we've got a long way to go. Thank you, Francis.
Um, and thank you, Ker Kerwin. At this point, I just want to say briefly thank you to everyone who participated for lended your who lended their voice through the chat feature to this conversation. Um, this was just a really um, just a powerful hour, and I want to thank you both. And then I want to turn it over to Kerwin to uh, close us out for the night. All right, thank you so thank much, you, Sarah. Sarah thank you for thank all you. the work you're doing. Thank you, Kerwin. Yes, awesome. Um, we uh, the work that Francis is talking about, the truth telling, the difficult work, the work of truth telling. That is part of the mandate of the Social Justice Coalition. Um, that is what we are going around to do, helping to help people understand the true history of our country, but also how we can get beyond where we are. Um, so I invite you to join us, uh, njremembrance.org. You can find out more information about what we're doing. We have our soil collection ceremony in Wampum Park in Eatontown, October the 24th at 3 p.m. Again, that information will be on njremembrance.org. We hope to see you there. Francis, thank you. Thank you all for being here and we wish you a good night.